everyone. Welcome everyone. Um, I'll let people join us. Um, we're starting the meeting in a couple of minutes. Um, and I'll just let uh, people join the meeting one after the other, because I see there are a lot of people in the waiting room. So that is happening as we speak. Um, and if I may invite everyone uh, in the audience to share your name, um, organization, and where you're calling in from, um, so we can get a, a bit of a feeling of, of who's in the room. That would be wonderful. Just wait a minute or so to do so. Perfect. We'll wait another minute and then we'll kick it off. So more people joining. Hi Jens, good to see you. Well, wonderful. Then um, I would say we, we kick it right off um, because we have a lot of ground to cover today. So welcome everyone. Uh, my name is um, Saskia Broyston and I'm uh, one of the co-founders and also CEO of Uno Social Business. Um, as many of you know, we believe in the power of business to end poverty and the climate crisis. Um, and we have two business units, UNOS Funds invests in social businesses in low income countries and UNOS Corporates helps large corporations like also the ones here in the room um, to use their core competences to solve social and environmental problems. So that's who we are and, um, and we will be discussing some of those topics today. Um, and today we're um, kicking off a new event series um, as part of our 10 year anniversary, yes. It has been 10 years that human social business has been around, time flies. So it's been quite a ride, um, but it's also been a very impactful ride over these last 10 years. Um, and the event series uh, that uh, we are um, kicking off will always focus on the stories of um, social businesses, either created by individual entrepreneurs or also by corporations um, and how they um, work on having business models that address very important social or environmental problems. So today I'm super, super excited to welcome you to our first event in this series. Um, and the topic is a very sexy topic, which is called, who made your bin liners? So basically who made the plastic bags that you throw your daily garbage into um, at home? That's what we will be speaking about, garbage bags. You can't imagine a more, more exciting topic, um, but indeed it is an extremely a, an exciting topic. And we will have um, a company and representatives of a company here um, from the absolute market leader in bin liners, which is called Cofresco. Not everyone will know the company Cofresco, but pretty much everyone, at least everyone based out of Europe, will know the brands of Cofresco, namely um, Swirl uh, um, plastic bags for garbages, or also Toppets um, that keeps your food um, uh, safe for longer, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm sure you know the brand, or some of you may even have their brands at home. And we're going to be speaking today with their CEO and, a, and another team member, um, but I'll introduce them in a second. So, but what will we be speaking about exactly? Uh, we'll be speaking about how to turn waste, which is seen as something, oh, we can throw it away. How do we turn that into value? And in particularly, we will be speaking about a joint venture, um, a new social business that Cofresco, together with Uno Social Business, have established in India to address the problem of plastic waste. So I'm super excited to, to dive into that in a second. But before we do that, just wanted to share a couple of important facts to just give you context. I think over the last couple of years, everyone has realized how important the plastic problem is and why that is such a disaster. But let me just like give you a couple of facts. So first of all, 
the world has been producing twice as much plastic waste um, as the last as the last two decades ago, and it's reaching somewhere around 400 um, to 500 million tons of plastic that's produced being produced newly every single year. However, the issue is that most of it is either ending in landfill, some of it's being incinerated, but the big majority actually ends up in rivers, it ends up on streets, it just ends up in the environment. And only somewhere around 9% are actually really successfully recycled. So in other words, 91% are ending up in bad places. So it's a massive problem. And if we look at it in terms of the greenhouse gas emissions, plastics, the whole production um, and, and, and everything around the, the plastics value chain today is actually accounting already for three and a half percent of the global greenhouse gas emissions. But with the growth of the plastic sector growing, um, it's planned that by 2040, so in, in, uh, in just a couple of years, it will be almost 20% of the overall greenhouse gas emissions will be coming from plastics. So plastics is, um, is not just um, a, a waste problem in general, and um, it's an incredible problem for climate change, but it's also a, a social problem. And um, why is it a social problem? Here in Europe, we're used to um, you know, having a relatively functioning recycling system to the point that around about 20% of our waste actually gets recycled versus the 9% globally. But in India, and that's one of the countries we're gonna focus in on today, that is not a norm at all, unfortunately yet. Um, and so um, waste gets dumped everywhere. There are landfills, but there's also a lot on streets, et cetera. And actually over 2 million people make their living based on waste picking. And those are often people from really the bottom of the pyramid um, that earn less than $2 a day and um, that pick waste from the streets that bring it to, let's say, recycling workshops and, and try and make a living with that. Uh, and many of them also being quite stigmatized um, for the work that they're doing. So waste is a problem that is relevant for the environment, but it's also an extremely important topic for um, from a from a social perspective. And so today we'll be speaking about a company called We Should Recycle or We Should Recycle. I should probably pronounce it betterly better. And um, that has been established in Bangalore, um, and um, that every year already collects around about two thousand tons of plastic waste, which will be used for the production of plastic bags like Swirl and Handy Bag and others that are part of the Cofresco brand. So um, we'll learn a lot more about that today. That was just a quick introduction. Um, and with that, I would actually like to uh, start introducing our star speakers of the day. Um, uh, the one is called Oliver Strilecki. Uh, he has been with Cofresco since 2011. Oliver, welcome. Um, really, really happy to have you here. Uh, really exciting. Oliver is now the CEO of Cofresco, but he's been obviously with the company for much longer. And actually, when we started this project together, he was the chief marketing officer. So he's been with us um, on this journey of actually developing this social business together for quite some time. And I'm grateful for your tenacity and your, you know, consistent focus on trying to make this a reality um, and of course Oliver has a has a, a you know an amazing career behind him um, working at Unilever before um, at Carlsberg and many other um, and many other consumer goods companies so we're really excited to have Oliver here um, and then we'll hear more from you in a second um, and our second speaker um, is Ashutosh Singh um, he has been with Cofresco since 2020 and he's actually the country manager in India that is heading up the Vishud Recycle um, Limited Company, which is the social business that we're going to be focusing in on today. So big, big welcome uh, to Oliver and Ashutosh. Um, we're delighted um, to have you here and to be able to, to speak about the important work that we're doing. And with that, um, I'd, I'd love to hand over to you guys um, in a second to, to give a little bit of an overview. And um, after that, we'll have a nice fireside chat, a little bit of a conversation of like, how did this all happen, et cetera, et cetera. And then we'll move to Q&A. And um, so everyone in the room also gets the ability and the, the, uh, the possibility to, to chat and, and learn from Ashutosh and, and, and also from Oliver. So Oliver and Ashutosh, I'll hand over to you um, to, to get this whole discussion started. Thank you, Saskia. So I start. Um, thank you for having us. 
uh, it's also a great pleasure and honor to, to, to join your first event. Um, and I must say, before I start talking about ferrocycle plastic, or we should, you are exactly right. Waste bin, bin liners, waste management is a very exciting topic. And it's especially exciting to, to think why people should buy your waste bin or waste liners um, instead of others. So um, this is quite quite a challenge, but this is just a side note. So maybe you can click Annika. So we have this presentation here. We start with a, with a nice photo which is not as nice where the photo is coming um, as, as it might look. So um, why did we found this, this business? How did we come to the idea to, to do We Shoot um, in India? Uh, that was initially um, the idea of my predecessor, of one of my predecessors, a former CEO, uh, and whose daughter came back from a, from a hiking trip to Asia. I think it was Nepal. And she presented him photos of dirty, wasteful streets full of plastic because there's nothing, there was no waste management in these cities. And she said, you know, guys, that you are a producer of plastic. So um, how do you solve this issue? And that's, that was a click, so to say, where we started thinking and he started thinking, how can I, as a plastic producer, Live the responsibility I have to nature and to, let's say, the, the complete environment and also to social questions behind. So from that we started and, and thought what could be our answer to this. In the, in the meantime, in parallel, we um, developed a um, sustainability strategy for, for Cofresco, where we say we are honest 100. We are honest in everything we do. So we don't want to cheat no one, no greenwashing at all, because we want to look into the mirror in the morning. And we are 100 circular, it means everything we do must be produced from, uh, from renewable resources or from recycled resources. And everything we sell should be biodegradable or recyclable. Uh, and on the other hand, but this is not topic of today, we also will uh, launch portfolios into the market which uh, support the multi-use uh, of products for food management. Mm -hmm. um, so based on this, we started thinking how can we contribute to this um, circular economy better than we did in the past. And we found out that what you already said that of the 100% of Plastic waste, 90% in, in, the, in the oceans, 90% is coming from eight big rivers in the world. Two of these big rivers are in India, the Ganges and the Indus. And it, it's flowing in because it's on the streets and the wind is pouring it into the river and from the river into the sea. And then, you know, all these pictures we have in mind. So how can we use plastic people don't treat as a value how can we make value out of it? And uh, we thought, okay, India must be a good location for this because there's so much waste on the street and the poverty line, the, the amount of poor people is, is very high in India. So 20%, uh, I think, are below poverty line. So we, we, we said we have the ability to do something highly environmental and social. And therefore we, we, we joined partners with uh, this Uno social business um, where we said we have a good partner on hand who could help us with this. And from this, it took a while, and Ashutosh will, will later tell why it also took a while to be there. Uh, we, had, we were more ambitious at the beginning than we could realize, but nevertheless, we are here and we are all very proud of this. Um, as a marketer, I always said, you, you have many projects in your life. But there might be only a few projects you remember when you're 90 years old. And I strongly believe that this will be one of these few projects uh, I'm thinking of. So, um, yeah, as a plastic producer, we have this responsibility. Plastic is not bad at all. Uh, it's only how you dispose it afterwards. That makes an issue with you. So coming from what we produce there, the idea is, and we already started to integrate it into our sphere bin liners. Um, and um, yeah, so let's say our products we produced in, in, in Bangalore, 
um, into the European market. So this is the core idea. And of course, we might have some questions later on um, um, to answer. And I will now hand over to Ashutosh, who could tell you a bit more about the process over there. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Ali, um, and thank you, ISP team, for uh, setting this up today. Uh, we're genuinely very excited to talk about the journey that we've had till now. Um, so uh, without ado, uh, let me give you a quick uh, background in terms of what we are actually doing here in India. So currently, uh, the processing facility that we have in Bangalore and can produce about close to 2,000 tons of plastic granulate every year. This is specifically low-density polyethylene or LDP. Uh, these reglanimates are then shipped to our production facility at Poland, where these are generally used uh, in, for the bin liner brands, which are swill and handy bags. So these uh, these LDP granules directly go there, and that's the uh, end product that they end up in. Uh, in terms of the working cycle that we have in the factory, we have about close to about uh, twenty workers and employees working in the factory here directly uh, under Vishuddh. And uh, these are back-ended supported by uh, multiple social enterprises and businesses, uh, which act as partners as well as suppliers to us. So uh, in terms of how the waste cycle works in India is that you have aggregators, collectors, and organizations who collect your waste and get it to us. So uh, the last mile waste pick uh, pickers are directly interacting with organizations like these. Uh, for example, we are working with the as of now, four or five different suppliers. We have Sahas Waste Management, we have Harsudala, we have Waste Ventures, uh, we have Nipra, uh, to name a few. And all of these, to be honest, are social businesses or enterprises which are focused on the social aspect of waste collection. Um, not just from uh, picking these vendors up, uh, we are actually thankful to Unis Social Business also that in the start, these, uh, these were the organizations that were identified by them also to understand uh, if they can provide to us. We maintain a high quality in terms of uh, having checks and balances with all of our suppliers that they comply to everything. We have external auditors who work with us, uh, for example, to Rhineland audits these organizations in terms of uh, are they doing the right thing the right way. Uh, and uh, everything is as per, I would say, the social norms of the world. Um, the, these are, I would call as the core uh, sections of our business, which is the direct employees that we have and the suppliers that we have. Uh, on top of this, we also work with uh, two large NGOs or non-for-profit organizations. We support them both financially and uh, in the uh, the in the scheme of things, all of the profits that would come out of Vishud, these will go into supporting these social causes. So uh, we have on one side, we have healthcare facilities, which are uh, run by Smile Foundation. These are mobile clinics and uh, uh, these basically provide the medical support to uh, waste picking families and communities. Uh, on the educational side, we have a separate uh, organization called Harsidala Trust. Uh, they run uh, what we call as uh, education libraries or education centers uh, for, uh, again, rag picking communities. So there's a there's a time period in all of these children's lives from where they come back from school and their parents are still at work because most of them are busy in the aggregation or collection of waste. So uh, between, say, for example, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m., these kids have nothing else to do. Uh, so these libraries become as center point for activities for all of these kids. So uh, this is the education side of things that we are supporting here uh, via the Vishud and Cofresco project. So that's a quick recap of the actual on-ground things that we are doing here in India. Uh, happy to take up uh, more questions and conversations on details of this. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much, Oliver and Ashutosh, to give you a little bit of a, give us a little bit of an idea. So just to perhaps summarize, so the way that the Vishud Recycle um, project actually works is you collect from waste pickers that are actually collecting waste in India. You collect that into your factory which is the social business, to then make pellets out of that plastic that you get. Those pellets then get shipped to your production unit where you actually make um, your plastic, swirl plastic bags and others that actually consumers will buy eventually. And a certain percentage um, of the inputs for those swirl pa um, plastic bags will now be this 
recycled plastic that has been picked up from Indian streets, and then a certain percentage to have the high quality still will still be made out of, let's say, original raw oil, if I understand that correctly. And so then the final product, the swirl plastic bag, then is now a recycled plastic bag that you can sell again um, in Europe, um, in your various countries of our operations. Almost. I hope that almost. The Almost. first part was perfect. The second part is that we, beginning of next year, already we're at 80%. At beginning of next year, we turn to 100% uh, recycling quota in our in our garbage bags. Amazing. A, an, um, a special quota, and this depends also on quality somehow, because quality is king, and you don't want to let your uh, waste bag tear in your kitchen. So mm -hmm. this is key, right, also for consumers. So we keep the quality and um, so we will also integrate as much as of we could get from 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 fair recycled plastic from the shoot um, so just to say if we shoot is a company fair recycled plastic is like what we call the the input the pellets um, but this will be higher and higher over, over time Fantastic. No, I think that's that's really great to hear because I remember, Oliver, when we started the project, the, the target was to say something like 50% of the plastic um, of the input would actually be from the should and the rest would be probably still um, like original oil. So it's it's really, really great to see that over the years you've been able to up the quality um, and actually ensure that it's almost up to 80% at this stage that is coming from the visual inputs. That's, that's really fantastic. But let me perhaps just start with a, a more controversial question, right, um, Oliver, which is obviously, um, why not just stop your business, your main business altogether? If we all hear like, of course, a core part of your your business is is plastics, um, and of course, we've talked about the problem of plastic. So, why not just stop it altogether? Would it not be preferable to sort of avoid producing more plastics rather than taking care of it later? Good question, which we ask ourselves as well, right? And also thinking about how can we, in the long run, exist? Is that right? So recording is in progress again. <laughs> um, we do want to record this answer because it's a very important you. answer. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And it's also a very important question. Um, we believe that there's a right for plastic. Plastic is a material, you, it's very hygiene, it's very versatile, and um, I think no one can imagine life without plastic. The question is, how do I treat especially single-use plastic? Do I throw it away in my, in my normal dustbin, or do I separate it, get it to the right station, and get it recycled? If it's recycled, it has some sort of value. And this value, uh, and, and in German, they call it Wertstoff, right? Wertstoff Tonne. Um, this value um, brings us to the, to the result that uh, we need to go on with, with cling film, waste bags, freezer bags, et cetera, because it helps people to, to let's say, master the household. It keeps food longer fresh. Yeah, this is our purpose. Um, to to help people at home and and uh, support them there. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, plastic itself is not a problem. The way it's disposed is a big problem. And as said before, what we find in the oceans, which is a major issue, this is coming from areas, social areas, where waste management is not a huge topic. They have other issues there. And we as as a company, a very small company with a very small business in India, we are a drop in the ocean, but we are one drop. And mm -hmm. we hope, and maybe today someone is listening here, that, that we have some followers mm -hmm. to help us, uh, let's say, being not only one drop. And, and, and actually just following on, um, Oliver, um, in terms of the drop in the ocean that you just mentioned, I think the number I quoted earlier is like um, global plastic production is something like 460 million tons every year. Um, how much do you feel like you will be able to contribute um, to this overall problem? I can only contribute to my portfolio. Mm -hmm. And if I 
make my portfolio and I can only speak for waste bag because it's not allowed to use recycled material into food foils. Um, there we have other ideas or have already executed other ideas of recircular. Um, my contribution must be that everything I sell as a company, as a person also, uh, is made of uh, fair recycled plastic or at least of recycled plastic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I can, I, you know, it's like a normal life. You, you cannot steer the others. They must follow your example. Mm -hmm. And perhaps just asking that similar question to you, Ashutosh, I mean, of the Indian sort of plastics market, uh, is it like what part do you think you will be able to capture? Like from how many waste pickers? Maybe we can also talk about it in impact numbers rather than just in kilos of plastic that you're going to extract from the streets. Um, but how, how do you see, what can this do for India, for the Indian context? Um, uh, to be honest, uh, the amount of people involved in the aggregation and collection of plastic runs in millions in India. Um, it's not a small community, but uh, with the current stats that we have, at least with the uh, touch points and contact basis that we have, uh, we are easily looking at targeting at least 15 to 20,000 I would say families together uh, because uh, how, how waste collection works in India, it's not just an individual or one person working in it, it's generally a family put together or a group of people put together. So you can identify them as relative families or you can identify them as notional families. So we are easily looking at touching at least till now, we've touched close to 15 to 20,000 families together who are in the process of aggregating waste uh, for us, uh, either be it directly or be it indirectly through our suppliers. So uh, it's a considerable chunk, but uh, it's a long way to go, Saskia. To be honest, uh, we're we'll talking about millions here. Uh, when uh, uh, we, as, as uh, Oliver was saying that uh, we are a small speck in this whole spectrum. Um, there is a lot of waste there. There are a lot of people who need the support on this or need to be uplifted or brought into the, uh, what we call the structured waste management side. And that'll takes time. So mm -hmm. we'd keep, uh, we'll keep making the small shovels uh, that we can do in this whole large pile of waste. And Ashtosh, maybe just to follow on. So you're saying like up to 15 to 20,000 waste picker families will be able to gain an income through this activity, which I mean, that's a significant amount of people already. And tell me just my understanding is that the one thing is that you're actually providing a stable income, but then there are also additional services that you're providing. Can you perhaps um, elaborate on that a little bit more, like what your sort of sure. theory of um, change is for those um, for those people? Um, see, uh, the, one of the biggest theories of change that we have is that uh, this is the traditional method of waste segregation or uh, traditional method of collecting waste in India. There is no way that, that we can make an impactful change without involving them. Now, uh, that is where the whole thought of Cofresco and the whole idea and the business came in from was that most of our profits will go back into the sector. Uh, that said, we in terms of the support systems that we provide, which is not just through the NGOs and the health programs and the educational programs that we run. Uh, to be honest, uh, if you would look at the Indian market, we generally pay higher than what somebody would get for this waste. Now, uh, we don't give this out outrightly. By end of it, we are a social business. By definition of it, we should be a circular chain economy in this and uh, we should be sustainable. So when we give out this premium or what, uh, what we give out as an additional cost for the material that we buy, this we trace back into saying that what happened with these financial supports. So for example, uh, we run... Uh, traceabilities in terms of when we provide additional income to either our suppliers or the waste picking families, what do you do with this income? Did you buy PPs with it? Did you uh, build up a better infrastructure for yourself? So uh, coming from that perspective, we want to develop them along with ourselves. It's not just a one line development that we're looking at, because if the support doesn't go to them, if this collapses, then the whole system collapses because these are, to be honest, the pillar, pillars of waste management in India. And we are looking at just one part of the waste. We are looking at LDPE only. You have HDP, metals and everything. So at least with this support system coming in, um, the income is stabilized. Plus, they have a, what we call as a 
stable buyer around. Uh, Vishuddh is here to stay. Kofresco is here to stay. Uh, mm. We give them a visibility in terms of a vision, in terms of uh, we will be here to keep providing the support to you. You'll always have this income coming from the LDP chain of materials that you have. Got it. So basically, if a waste picker collects multiple things with the LDP, they can go with the specific type of plastics. For those of you who don't know what is LDP, they can come to you with the other stuff. They have to go to other people uh, just to clarify that. And so in other words, you cannot help them with metals or whatever else they may be collecting, but you can collect the, you can provide them a, a stable income stream for the LDP. Oh. And I'm, I'm actually getting like there are all kinds of questions already coming in into the chat and I'll just pick some of them up, even though we'll still have a Q&A where more questions can come. So please, everyone in the audience, feel free to continue adding things. And one of them came to the whole topic of challenges. And, and that goes, maybe I'll start with you, Oliver, but also, of course, Ashtosh uh, sharing the, the Indian side of things. I mean, this whole collaboration that we started um, together was was it actually started a number of years ago and I, I know then COVID hit and and you know now the next energy crisis is hitting etc cetera, etc cetera. so like the world doesn't look the same way um, as it did um, when we started but the major problems like the climate crisis the social issues the plastics issues are still the same it's just like our attention has been going somewhere else can you perhaps, Oliver, walk us a little bit through, you know, the major challenges that you face to get where you're at? Um, and then I'd love to hear Ashutosh's uh, version of that as well. Yeah, I mean, the easiest thing was to have the idea <laughs> and to find out which country and, let's say, location we would go. Um, then we, we um, let's say, to set up a business in India requires a lot of documents, a lot of stamps, a lot of um, discussions with authorities, um, which you cannot imagine when you are in India, let's say. So this, let's say, setting up business was not that easy, it was also underestimated by, by Germans, put it this way. Um, we had a project manager who worked very, uh, let's say, full time on this project, uh, living more in India than here. And she, she did a very well job on this, um, let's say, supporting both sides. So, and we were more or less able to start business to have the partners on hand before COVID started. And that made, let's say, uh, a second challenge, uh, even more challenge uh, received by us, by, by Ashutosh, our Indian team. Maybe he can tell you a bit more about why this was so difficult. Maybe you can imagine. Mm, thanks, Oliver. So, um, to be honest, uh, we, uh, just from timeline perspective, uh, we, we broke ground uh, for the Vishud factory uh, in March, 15th of March somewhere. Um, and 23rd of March was the first major lockdown that came in. Uh, we, there was nothing which was moving on ground. Everybody was locked back into homes. And uh, the first three to four months where there was no, not even construction which was allowed. So we, we packed up everything and we were just sitting tight and doing our back-end homework in terms of getting paperwork ready. So that's where the challenge started. Uh, once we started setting up the unit, yes, we had a lot of issues in terms of logistics that we were talking about. Construction was difficult. Everything was literally slow paced, uh, be it permissions, approvals, permitting from the government. Most government departments were running, running on what we call a skeleton stuff. So something which would take a week was taking a couple of months. Uh, transport timelines and globally were just haywire. So those were, I would say, the logistic ch challenges which... Uh, were brought in by COVID on the infrastructure setup side. But what we realized later, once the infrastructure was about to up, get up and running, um, all of the supply chains, suppliers, the uh, individual colonies, the families that we had identified, everything got disrupted because when COVID hit, um, waste collection had literally stopped in India. Uh, there was no waste collection which was happening. Forget segregation and recycling. So that was the next big challenge that came up to us. Um, the, the, in the larger scheme of things, uh, this was one of the first projects which was being done on a socially compliant platform for production 
uh, or recycling of ldp in india uh, we had challenges as difficult as the the pollution control boards not even identifying us as a, a good recycler where didn't, they didn't have classifications for us in terms of uh, if you are a zero discharge plant how do we recycle you or how how do we give you a certificate on that so those challenges were multiple but uh, i would say the resilience of cofresco group uh, in terms of uh, just marching on with the project despite all of the issues that we had uh, just brought us still here and um, i would say the monsoons the water logging problems in bangalore the restrictions they they just kept going on and on uh, but i'm just happy to say that uh, as of today we have a facility which is producing close to about 2000 tons of plastic uh, every year uh, re uh, recycled plastic every year and this is be coming back into the economy and that just wins the day for all of us and i know it's just the start of the journey but yes that's that's a couple of challenges that we had in india great and i can also i mean like we're talking about a lot of regulatory issues here in in the indian context but um coming back to you oliver again i mean i can only imagine importing let's say plastics from a social business in india to europe and ensuring that certain quality standards are met for the further on production i can only imagine that that must have also been fairly complex i don't know if there's anything more you wanted to share there but it's still it's still because let's say finding the right qualities uh, i just forgot to mention that let's say one of the machines who who were bought in germany and and let's say um, running our washing lines there are not performing well and when you're in covid let's say the, the german technicians can't come and it takes a while to do it while while let's say zoom calls to to get local technician, uh, technicians making it um, running um, um, and therefore, yeah, this takes a while. Um, but and it's it's also no secret that we are not, let's say, full in line with our initial business case, right? Um, this is also fine for us because we believe into it, and um, this is the most important thing. And it's yeah. not only us as a team; it's also, let's say, the whole Melita Group, as well as uh, the Benz family behind, um, who are owning the Melita Group. And this mm -hmm. is very important for us, and uh, that makes us even more proud on this. <laughs> and maybe uh, just thinking also, I think Ashtar, you sort of started uh, hinting at it. What is the long term vision for this? And, and perhaps also here, Oliver, I'll start with you. Um, I mean, what is the long term vision? Is like we should going to be, um, you know, you know, one social business in a line of various other similar initiatives that uh, Milita will be doing. Um, uh, how do you over time even foresee your whole business model at Cofresco perhaps evolving, transforming to become even more, let's say, positive for people on the planet? Um, and then maybe even more on the practical level for you, Ashdosh, like how do you see the social business evolving? Will it also have other clients apart from Cofresco in the future? Will it move into different types of plastic eventually? And um, uh, how do you see that uh, going? And how do you see also the impact evolving? But I'll start with you, Oliver, more on the meta level of like how this is impacting your own company. We have two, two sorts of business. We have the food management, you know, from, from topics, and we have the waste management. The food management will sooner or later be trans transformed from single use to multi use plastics. Mm -hmm. So, um, but for the waste. So, like Tupperware or whatever that is the right word. For that. There's more than Tupperware and more ideas than <laughs> the containers. For um, sure. The Coca version of that, clearly. Exactly. Um, and we are, we are on to this, so to say. And then you have the waste waste management, and their multi-use gets a bit more difficult, as you can imagine. So there we will stick, let's say, with the core portfolio. We make this core portfolio, uh, let's say, recircular is the idea behind. And the 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 final vision we have is that all materials in our waste bag is coming from social business as fair recycled plastic as we should. If it's only coming from Bangalore, from from uh, the company we are working now, I don't know. It might be also a good idea to have it in, in similar places and in, in, in other countries uh, where there's also a need to do this. Uh, at this time, we are limited to the volumes we can sell. All right. Also, there we have some headspace. 
but uh, for the time being, we will fulfill, let's say, our own vision by our own products, by our own insightful products. But the, the, let's say this is not does not mean that we stop here. You're, you're mute. Sorry, I think I think it was really nice, Oliver, how you just described your food business, which is like the the you know the plastic folie. I can't even cover the the cling film that that may be transformed into multiple use um, plastic products. Um, and the social business actually, you know, being um, for the bin liners, which just are by definition single use in that sense. How are you? Um, are you currently already a um, um, able to um, supply hundred percent of your do demand uh, with the with the Vishud uh, recycling products, or um, how many years will it take until you're actually able to do that at this stage? If you know the numbers by heart, if not, we can move on. I can tell we have, let's say, the, we, we could do 20% actually, mm -hmm. we need. Um, and it will take much more time to do the 100%, mm -hmm. but we are still in the learning phase. Mm -hmm. uh, we, it's also very honest, I think, to, to, to say that not from the beginning, everything run as it should, as we would love to it. Um, mm -hmm. COVID hit us and we have explained, I think, quite deeply. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, this is something we are patient. We have a lot of brave um, in, in order to make it happen because we want it. Mm -hmm. And um, this is something the whole company, as they say, embracing. Absolutely. And Ashtosh, maybe for you, your vision, uh, where do you see um, the company? Where do you see we should recycle so the social business going? And then I'm, I, and after that, I'll actually open for questions. So if you want to um, throw more questions into the chat or even then speak up, um, you're invited. Um, but, Saskia, but, uh, Saskia to, to be honest, uh, from, from the scope perspective, I'm not uh, looking at it from a business perspective. Uh, as, as we've been talking about, this is a very small chunk of what we are doing or what uh, what can be done on uh, recycling of plastic. And they're looking at one section, which is LDP. Um, you have multiple other types of plastic. Somebody mentioned HDP also uh, in the chats. Uh, you have PET, you have ABS. There, you have multiple varieties of plastic available out there. And by end of it, these are all, most of them are recyclable, uh, barring a couple of uh, few of them. So uh, coming from that perspective there is more in enough space for this to grow uh, be it as a social business be it as a commercial business be it as a business funded by the government um, there is no stopping this and uh, um, as, as um, Oliver was stating earlier also uh, it's not just plastic that it's it's not bad like the 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 ecological footprint on plastic is really really good and the problem is that when it ends up in the environment, that's bad. So mm -hmm. uh, from, from a social business perspective, I think if we can inspire even uh, five other organizations to come into this, we'll still not be creating the amount of dent that we want to in the whole recycling chain. So uh, uh, not just in India, this could be done in most countries which have a waste problem. It's not limited by geography. Um, I would say it's uh, limited by the will and vision of an organization. That's about it. Absolutely. I think that uh, that speaks to sort of the limitless creativity of humans, that if we just put our mind to it, we could make so much more change than uh, the way we're currently doing it, just being passengers on a plane that is you know, just going in the direction that we've set up um, so far. Hey, but um, I'm, I'm, I'm just look, starting to look at the, the chat and, and just seeing a couple of additional questions um, up here. Um, so one, one that I hear uh, see from, from Nele um, is around, uh, if you can describe a bit more how you actually found your suppliers um, and also what criteria they need to fulfill to be able to supply to you in terms of, I mean, I think I talked about a little bit the, the quality issues that one would face, that one may face. Um, and I think it also comes from the whole, you know, there's a whole trend around what we call social procurement that corporates want to more and more buy from social businesses, but then they may run into quality issues or um, whatever else or volume issues. How is that for you? So how did you find your suppliers and, and what are the criteria that they need to fulfill? 
Oliver, if you don't mind, I'll take this one. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, we we got a lot of support in terms of identifying suppliers with the uh, YSB India. So because they have uh, they have fair bit of operations in India, and since it's a social uh, startup incubator, uh, they had connects with a lot of social organizations that were dealing with the cycle of waste or the life cycle of waste. I would uh, call it. Um, that was the first level of identification where somebody would introduce us to a supplier. Uh, mm -hmm. To be honest, that's the tip of the iceberg. That's where we step in and then then the compliance starts. Where Because one of the largest challenges in this sector is it's an unstructured sector. I'm not sure about other countries, but in India, it's totally unregulated. It's a, a cat-eat-cat market out there. And to get people up to speed on, uh, I would say, just basic things that you need to keep your employees safe. They have to come to a clean workspace. Uh, these were basic stuff that we had to talk to people about. Uh, we were fortunate that in the initial but waste start, taking is not a clean business. So how do you yeah, make absolutely, sure that they're clean? Absolutely. I mean, See, it's not a clean business, but there's a clean way of doing it also. Uh, somebody is somebody needs to go and pick up waste. You can at least give him basic PPEs. You can give him gloves, masks. Uh, eye protection we now know that word since covid obviously the exactly <laughs> like, thank you covid i would say thank you COVID, <laughs> I would say. um so as simple as that like uh, giving masks and gloves that that was not a standard practice uh, in india like uh, even for organizations which work with the government the municipal corporation waste collectors you'll find about 70 percent of them without pps that's the situation that india was in so to identify suppliers, it was a challenge, but the next set of challenge actually came back in terms of monitoring these suppliers, saying that, hey, you need to do these, these, these basic things at least. Uh, the first round of compliance that we ran with most of our suppliers, we were fortunate to have suppliers which are socially oriented and they understood the background of what we are trying to do. So from there, it became much more easier. But that said, we are still mandated to do periodic checks with our suppliers in terms of all the way down to their supply chain as in where did you pick up this from which which uh, rag picking family did you get it from or which colony did you get it from and these go out as high as that we we plan to do impact assessments also into all of these that what all we created what difference did it make so uh, yes it was a challenge YSB did help us with it and I think once the word starts spreading uh, because the initial three, four suppliers uh, came in through the networks of ISP. Uh, post that, the, we've got, I think, seven or eight different more suppliers walking into us because the word started spreading that there is a buyer, a recycler in the market who's one doing everything right. Uh, they're not burning waste and giving you a certificate for plastic. They're actually recycling plastic. And second, they actually care about the suppliers. So uh, we're not here to squeeze the life out of a supplier. So um, th th I think that partly answers the question i don't think there's a definite answer to that no but 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 i think absolutely and and perhaps maybe just also a little side note because i also see like uh, folks from ikea etc here in the room um for all of those in the room some of them all, i also saw that there uh, that there's some entrepreneurs here um that are also in the waste in the broader waste space more in the um uh, the wet waste space um, we at Uno Social Business have, have launched a collaboration last year together with a waste foundation from the Netherlands um, and um, also in the Indian context, um, IKEA SE, um, to actually invest in waste-related social businesses. So not just the plastic waste, but also the broader waste spectrum could also be textile waste, et cetera. So if there are any entrepreneurs in the waste, in the recycling um, space, and, and also in the broader wash space, so also hygiene, et cetera, do reach out to us um, because this is a topic that we're actually focusing on more because we just see that it's such a massive problem, not just in India, around the world, um, and, and we want to invest more in it. And we also feel that there's a, a massive opportunity to get corporations involved because um, just like Oliver was describing, there is an ambition to, um, for um, uh, Cofresco to become circular, but also many other companies want to be more and more circular and, and want to have a more social impact um, in their value chain.
So that's all what we call social procurement. So when corporates try and buy from social businesses and, and actually help them grow, but also improve their own ESG footprint. So that just as a little side note, um, I'm just looking at um, other questions. Does anyone in the room have any questions? You can also speak up now if you want, if you dare to, um, just please introduce yourself um, and um, we'll be able to let you speak. Um, I see Nele. Um, Nele, you have raised your hand. Why don't you go ahead? Unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Um, my name is Nele. I'm from from Porticus. Um, we are we are partner of the social business. And I have a I have a question on um, on the social business that you set up in India, um, where you are basically doing the social recycling yourself. Um, and I was I was wondering, is there is there a market, a big enough market for that to also um, sell your granular to other uh, companies that are actually um, maybe also your competitors? <laughs> um, you know, because I think I think that what you what you are doing is obviously a solution that you are using yourself, but it could have you know, great value um, for other sectors, and um, and yeah, I'm just I'm just wondering if if this is something you're thinking of. Very good question. Thank you. Um, maybe I, I I answer right. Um, for the time being, we don't have enough for ourselves. Once we have enough, we hopefully have also a bit more attractive prices. Because also no secret that there's a markup in. Let's say it's uh, fair recycled plastic is more expensive than normal recycled plastic. It's much more expensive than virgin plastic. So this is our investment into it. And we believe uh, generating economies of scale that we would, let's say, in the long run, be more positive there also. More experience in producing. Once we have more than we can use our own, we will make a new business model out of it. Uh, it's no reason, but this is not our original idea. Our original idea is to, let's say, to make the plastic we bring into the uh, the, uh, the circuit, the circular economy, make it recircular. Uh, but that will be the long, or is the long, long run idea. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Oliver. Thanks, Nile. Are there other questions that are coming up? Yes, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Great. So my name is Jennifer. I work with an organization called Takataka Taka Solutions. We're based in Kenya. We're integrated waste management services. So we do waste recovery, waste collection. We do sorting. Um, we also do in-house recycling. We recycle about 95% of the waste we collect. So recently, we just launched our flexible palletizing plant. One of our biggest challenge is that we can't find the offtake market. And there is so much resistance among the flexible bin liner manufacturer here to use recycled pellets and granules. So I'm, I'm not so sure. I think right now I'm at a point that I'm a bit confused in terms of what do you think are the manufacturers looking for in terms of quality and what might their hesitation be um, in, in terms of using recyclable material. Could I answer, uh, maybe I start? Sure, sure, Oli. We are the only brand in the market, so to say, so we are seeking for best quality possible. So this is uh, point number one, and we, let's say, we learned that doing a recycling process on a smaller scale, as we are doing it, comparing to other big recyclers. Um, this is still a challenge, but let's say will be overcome. Secondly, um, the, the markets, when you are not selling it as a brand, are private label markets, very price driven, cost driven. So it might be, and I, I don't know your, exactly, uh, your exact challenge there, but, but I could imagine that looking on prices and comparing it to virgin material, um, that is not that is not very profitable for 
for possible customers of you. That would be my my thoughts, not knowing exactly. But um, yeah, so the markets for is is big for it, depending on let's say the territories we are we're speaking about. But let's say Europe is a big market for recycling material. But on the other hand, let's say um, the demands are also in terms of quality and price are challenging. So in other words, there needs to be an off taker that actually also cares about the fact that the plastic is a social plastic and not just and recycled plastic and can actually perhaps also gain a price increase from actually also marketing that that's the case. And Oliver, we had that conversation in our pre-chat, but I just wanted to also bring it into this group here that I was hoping that the perhaps the silver lining of the you know Russia crisis that is leading to higher energy prices all around the world and thereby higher oil prices, aka oil as the import for virgin plastics, mm -hmm. would now also hopefully lead to the fact that recycled plastics like the ones of the should, like the ones of Takataka Taka Solutions would actually be something that's more attractive because it becomes more price attractive to, uh, compared to a higher oil price. But you kind of said that that may not be the case. Can you elaborate? Not that we uh, that we see it, let's say, um, in huge numbers. Yeah, it might be that, it's, that the markup has decreased a bit, but it's still very high. And also our suppliers, and the suppliers of recycled material know that there's, let's say, um, that the demands are increasing for recycled. And as the market demands are increasing, um, then um, prices are, are going up. And but that, but that would mean for the social businesses that they would perhaps hopefully then be able to realize higher prices. So that is in some ways perhaps some good news if I interpret it that. Yeah, we yeah sure we we let's say we as a social business as I said before we are even more expensive than a non-social business, and um, so um, and we we are the only ones who actually want to or let's say we didn't ask others but but we still produce with it right so this is our idea mm -hmm. and um, so that goes to the that decreases our profitability put it this way. So it's our investment into the idea. And, um, but your question, uh, to answer your question, let's say there's a, a shift also in prices for recycled material going mm -hmm. um, comparable to the ones we have for, for the four version. Got it. Okay, I'm also just looking at the time and I, unfortunately we have to wrap. Um, so um, a big, big thank you to Oliver, a big, big thank you from uh, for, uh, to Ashutosh um, for your time today about talking about this fantastic social business. We should recycle, that should be our motto of the day, we should recycle. Um, and um, I am um, also grateful for the you know interactive um, questions coming from from the audience, and a lot of people clearly have a recycling um, uh, interest. Um, just to let everyone know, um, in the coming weeks we will have additional um, sessions like this where we will um, highlight um, a social business. Um, the next meeting is around who has farmed your coffee beans. So it will be around a, a, a coffee pro a producing social business in Colombia. Um, and the, the one after that will be um, who has uh, sewn your um, Ikea pillows. So you'll hear about a social business that produces um, pillows for Ikea um, and at the same time creates uh, higher incomes for um, individual artisans. So, so those will be the upcoming um, events in this series. Feel free to look at, look with them on LinkedIn, you can sign up there and, and uh, I hope we'll have similar, uh, similarly engaging discussions then. So thank you everyone. Um, I hope it was interesting. Again, big, big thank you um, to Oliver, a big, big thank you to Ashutosh and um, do follow us on LinkedIn and learn more about those upcoming events. Thanks so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank